The prison industrial complex is a system situated at the intersection of government and private interests. It uses prisons as a solution to social, political, and economic problems. It includes human rights violations, the death penalty, slave labor, policing, courts, the media, political prisoners, and the elimination of dissent. I walk around like that nigga, finger on the trigger. If a nigga wants some smoke, I let the chopper eat his liver. I came with the 38, I'm leaving with a body. If he try me doing sloppy, shooting out the big body. I walk around like that nigga. A commodity is, in the first place, an object outside of us. A thing that, by its properties, satisfies human wants of some sort or another. The nature of such wants, whether they spring from the stomach or from fancy, makes no difference. Neither are we here concerned to know how the object satisfies these wants, whether directly as means of subsidence or indirectly as means of production. Karl Marx. Blackface is a concept that gets thrown around quite a lot nowadays. Beginning its journey as a turn to refer to a specific type of minstrelsy, it has sort of evolved to encompass a wide spectrum of behaviors past strictly painting one's face black. Khadija made a great video about digital blackface where she outlined some behaviors that aren't strictly relegated to traditional methods. Great video, watch it. In this video, she talks more about online behaviors with a specific emphasis on faceless profile using black reaction gifs and memes. And in an effort to not plagiarize her video, I'm going to zoom out and focus on the commodification aspect in wider American society. Now, before we get too deep into the commodification of the black identity, I think it's important to establish what exactly minstrelsy is and how it has effectively evolved into the most digital forms we see today. Chattel slavery was a uniquely evil system even at the point of its proliferation during the transatlantic slave trade. Unlike indentured servitude where a person was enslaved for a set amount of time and subsequently released when their debt was paid, chattel slavery was predicated on generational slavery. The enslaved people were considered a property to the slave owner and thus them and their entire lineage were subject to the same fate from birth. The goal was to use the unpaid labor to produce capital, of course. For the entire industry of agriculture in colonial America, the enslaved people were not only a commodity, but the means in which to produce commodities. However, it goes further than just operating as the means of production. Black people were commodified in every aspect of their being, mind, body, and soul. And minstrelsy is just the culmination of that. Cut off all the tails on your cows. That's right. Why, man, that's terrible. I know, I know. You know what I'm gonna have to do now? I know, tell me. What are you gonna have to do now? Well, boy, I'm gonna have to sell them all wholesale. Well, why are you gonna have to sell them all wholesale? Well, I can't retail them. <laughs> the term minstrelsy, contrary to popular belief, did not specifically refer to blackface during its inception in the early 19th century. Now, don't get me wrong. Blackface was a hallmark of most minstrel shows at the time, a defining feature even. However, it was not the only racist characteristic in the theatrical entertainment form. I would say reducing it down to such is understating just how damaging these shows were to American culture. The father of minstrel entertainment was Thomas Dartmouth Rice, the creator of the well-known and historically infamous character Jim Crow. Now when we're talking about the commodification of the black identity, we are talking about this man. He's the pioneer of that. T.D. Rice was an unexceptional traveling actor of little notoriety until his song and accompanying performance, Jump Jim Crow, debuted in Louisville, Kentucky in 1829. It featured him, a white man, painting his face black with burnt cork and invoking a character of a stereotypical black man, that being Jim Crow. Now the character of Jim Crow referenced the stereotype of some slaves pretending to be dumb in order to get out of doing slave work. Whether this stereotype is actually based in fact or reality, probably the same as all stereotypes. Not really, but who's who's to say? Who knows? Maybe maybe he did see a slave who was being lazy to get out of doing slave work. He was like, I like that. Either way, doesn't change the actual reality. There are roots tying back to West African folklore about why crows were used specifically and thematic elements tying them to the stereotype, but that isn't necessarily relevant to the legacy per se. Naturally, due to what I would call the circumstances of the time, Jim Crow exploded in popularity and Rice's new genre of entertainment firmly cemented itself into white American society. It was so popular, in fact, that one of the earliest minstrel companies, Chrissy Minstrels, played on Broadway for nearly 10 years. So yeah, shout out Broadway, one of the many modern American institutions with a racist past. 
love that. That's the real American institution right there. That's how you know Broadway is truly American because of this racist past. Now, Jim Crow was not the only caricature embodied in minstrelsy. Just like any medium of entertainment, minstrelsy caught up on a host of archetypes with a variety of characteristics for its stories. These archetypes may have differed in many respects, but they all served a singular purpose, painting black people as subhuman in some respect, to show that black people were better off being enslaved than if they were not. To understand how the legacy of minstrel shows penetrate modern society, we must first understand these archetypes. Following the most well-known archetype Jim Crow is the Zip Coon. The Zip Coon archetype was created to mock black people who were free from enslavement. The Zip Coon was arrogant, ostentatious, and pretentious, often dressed in high-end clothing as opposed to the rags that Jim Crow wore. However, as a contradict his seemingly sophisticated appearance, he would often speak in misused idioms and malaprops, words used incorrectly instead of similar sounding words often in this context to portray intelligence. The main purpose behind this archetype was to show the audience that free blacks were still blacks nonetheless and thus were still subhuman. And no amount of money or sophisticated clothing would change that fact, even while being free. The Zip Coon and Jim Crow would later be merged into one archetype called the Coon, and we'll talk about them later. The Mammy. The Mammy has been a staple in American society from slavery to Jim Crow and beyond. This caricature has served an important political and social purpose in painting black people as content under the horrid system of slavery. The Mammy was often portrayed as a smiling black woman who was wise, content, and fiercely loyal to servitude. Although having children of her own, she's completely desexualized. Her work and being accepted into the household of her white employers being her only main priority. Her take no back talk mentality and fierce independence led her to being one of the few black faces that advertisers were willing to market off of. See Aunt Jemima. Uncle Tom. Why is you lying to me? Then why did you cry? Why is I'm scaring you? Because you're scared. The Uncle Tom is arguably the most well-known minstrel archetype in contemporary society. The Uncle Tom character was stolen by minstrels from the novel Uncle Tom's Cabin by abolitionist Harriet Beecher. Toms are typically portrayed as good, gentle, religious, and sober. In many respects, they are the counterpart to the mammy and the antithesis to the coon. Toms are dependable workers, eager to serve, and would often turn on their own to please the master. If you know Uncle Ruckus from the Boondocks, then yeah, pretty much exactly that. It's also important to note that the archetype seen in minstrelsy and in modern media is a bastardized version of the character from the original novel. While keeping certain defining characteristics, the archetype lacks a lot of the nuance and intent the original author imparted, reducing the character down to a simple race trader. This archetype was also one of the few that advertisers were willing to market of. See Uncle Ben's Rice, the buck or the brute. The buck is a black man whose sole desire is the white woman. As his name suggests, being a reference to the adult male deer, he is large and sometimes menacing. The Brute is an offshoot of the buck archetype with a specific emphasis on the aggressive nature of the black man. The Brute is a fiend, an animalistic criminal deserving of death who targets helpless victims, specifically white women. Both the buck and the brute archetype paint black men as hypersexual and overtly aggressive, and they are commonly wrapped into one. The Wench, or the Jezebel. The Wench or the Jezebel is a temptress a hypersexual black woman with an insatiable lust for sex. This stood in stark contrast to the white European women who were often seen as self-respecting women who valued modesty. This archetype was used as a rationale by white slave-owning men when they were inevitably caught assaulting their slaves behind their wives' back. Extraordinarily similar to the rationale that the wives were used when they were caught doing the same to the black male brute slaves as well. The mulatto. The mulatto is a mixed-blooded black person who would intentionally or unintentionally pass as white. The stories involving this archetype were often tragedies, where the mulatto could only feel true happiness when they renounced their supposed whiteness and embraced their subhuman nature as a black person. The winter Jezebel roles were often played by mulattoes as well. The Piccaninny. The Piccaninny was a childlike character, usually with unkempt hair, bulging eyes, red lips, and wide mouths. Piccaninnies have a strong association with watermelon, usually not showing up in a story without one or the other making an appearance. This is where we see a lot of the stereotypes that black people are still associated with today come from. Now that we've determined the history of minstrelsy and what archetypes it embodied, we can now focus on contemporary society and establish how figures encapsulate the essence of minstrelsy in an effort to commodify the black identity, mind, body, and soul. 
We believe he does not object to the Virginia minstrels, Chrissy minstrels, the Ethiopian serenaders, or any of the filthy scum of white society who have stolen from us a complexion denied to them by nature in which to make money and pander to the corrupt taste of their white fellow citizens. Frederick Douglass. Now I know what you may be asking yourself. Sean, what does the commodification of the black mind mean? How is it different than the black body or the black soul? And that's a good question. One that I had to ask myself while writing this video. Well, the answer I came up with is that the black mind focuses on how our culture, our music, our creativity is viewed and consumed by those outside of us. The black soul, however, focuses on an inward perspective of our culture and how actors within our community will compromise their connection to that community in order to profit. And we'll focus on that more in the soul section of the video. But before that, we have to talk about music. Music has been and will continue to be an essential part of the black identity documenting its experience in America. In fact, with its roots tracing back to it even predating slavery, the historical and cultural significance of many contemporary genres, but especially rap music, is integral to understanding the black experience. Derived as one of the four major components of hip-hop in the early 1970s, the art form has exploded with its influences reaching into genres worldwide. From major artists hailing north of the US border, having vibrant scenes in the UK and other European countries, appearances in a small niche genre in Asia known as Korean pop music, it's safe to say that rap music has cemented its place as one of the most popular musical genres in the world. With this popularity, the rap scene, and by extension black culture, gains its social legitimacy, however it loses something that's been integral to its growth, its authenticity. Now firstly, this is not an indictment of SoundCloud rap or mumble rap or whatever you want to call it, nor is this video a critique of that genre of music. But when we're talking about minstrelsy and the commodification of the black identity, we have to talk about its actors. Lil Pump burst on the rap scene with his single aptly titled Lil Pump, February 8th, 2016. Now, it's difficult to tell exactly how many views it received upon its initial launch, but in the time since its release, it's racked up a modest, a, a, a modest 30.9 million plays. Crazy. See, I'm 21 at the time of writing this script, and I, I was 15 when this song came out. But I didn't hear this first song in my day, back in my day, you know. My introduction to Lil Pump was his song, Boss. But regardless, walking down the school hallways and listening to these songs being blasted out of people's backpack speakers, you really got the impression that none of this was supposed to be taken seriously. This is not a person that's supposed to be a serious rapper and that he's just memeing. It's just, just a meme. I mean, this is what everybody's favorite music man had to say about his first project. And again, like Perp, Pump is cut from the SoundCloud cloth. He is a part of a new wave of rappers that hop on these overblown trap beats, have really just hypnotic, repetitive flows, ultra simplistic lyrics, all of which are delivered with this electrifying energy. The content is incredibly catchy, yet also um, intoxicatingly dumb. And to be quite honest, I thought some of Pump's earliest singles were, were kind of kind of dumb too, like they were just borderline memes, which is a fence I think a lot of modern rappers kind of straddle these days, the, the, the border between being a musician and being a meme. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just an observation I'm making. And I do like memes, but I was just kind of sitting here thinking, is Little Pump actually an artist? Is he a rapper that is, is truly worth taking seriously? Personally, I felt like I wouldn't really come to a conclusion on that until I heard a project of this magnitude. Fun fact, Fantano actually rated this project a seven out of 10, which did not sit very well with his audience at the time. But I do think it brings up a good point. You are allowed to like Lil Pump songs or anybody's songs I talk about for that matter. Enjoying Lil Pump's music does not make you a racist, but I do believe that it's important to understand where these things come from. Firstly, it's important to note that Lil Pump is not black, he's not black, he's Colombian, even though his use of a certain racial term might convince you otherwise. But besides that, as I stated earlier, it all felt very over the top. Like it wasn't supposed to be taken seriously, like he was playing a character. Hey, hey bro. What is that, bro? Why are you smoking swishes? 
What is that? I only smoke backwood. Carlo backwood, bitch. Carlo backwood. Carlo backwood, boy. Oh, 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 fuck On a whole lot of swag shit. A whole lot of gang shit. Y'all know about this, man. There's a whole lot of gang shit going on, bro. Y'all ain't on it, bro. On fault now. On fault now. Let me see that. You're going 70 miles per hour. <laughs> How long would it take you to drive 70 miles? 70, nigga? Oh, why? Why it's... 70? Explain to the camera why 70. Because one time 70, 70. Well, who the fuck said anything about one? Where did one come from? You're going 70 <laughs> miles per hour. <laughs> oh, it's one a... hour. Oh! And you can see that through the progression of his looks. The face tats, colored dreads, prominent chains, and grills that became a signature look used by other non-black rappers were seemingly popularized by Gazi. These characteristics were, of course, used by black rappers before non-black artists parodied them. So we have a non-black person playing a character embodying stereotypes of black people while profiting off of said stereotypes. Where have I heard that before? Lil Pump is not the only person who perpetuates this archetype. One of the most accomplished characters is Daniel Hernandez, or 6 9 Daniel has been rapping since 2012 but never found true mainstream success until he donned his signature rainbow hair, rainbow grills, and extensive set of tats. And immediately we can see similarities between Gazi and Daniel, both non-black Hispanics becoming famous off of being a meme before collaborating with established artists and who also frequently tend to use the n-word. Now, points to 6 9 here because I do think he is more musically talented than Lil Pump is. However, he immediately loses those points for his other controversies that we all seem to kind of just forget about. But he's hanging out with Andrew Tate now, so he's within good company. But we see the pattern, right? There's not much difference between Gazi Garcia and Daniel Hernandez, but we can definitely see the archetype forming. But there's another duo of rappers of Hispanic descent who have followed 6 9 and Lil Pump, sporting their own set of face tats, grills, chains, and colored dreads. The next generation of this archetype is, of course, story to Gazi and Daniel, Alex and Frankie first exploded to popularity as, say it with me now, a meme. What? Unlike their predecessors, however, possibly due to the decline of this style of rap, the Island Boys never found the same sort of mainstream success. Even now, a little after a year after their initial launch, they are unable to capture even a fraction of their original listeners to their new music. This is in stark contrast to even Lil Pump, who was able to garner over 60 times the amount of views in the same duration, even a half decade after his original launch. So they aren't as popular as Lil Pump or 6 9 but the fact that the character that they are playing, which follows the same sort of archetype, is able to reach the level of popularity that it did is the crux of my point. And that's not even all of them. Bad Baby, Whoa Vicky, Lil Tay, Rice Gum even, they all follow the same archetype. They put on a costume. They put on a costume, a face of a black person, if you will. And they jump around, they dance around, they act a fool for a little bit of clout. And white folks lap it up. But the, the worst part is that black folks do too. Black folks do too. The only reason why any of these people have any sort of musical legitimacy is because black people give it to them. You know what the difference between somebody like Tom McDonald is from 6 9 or the Island Boys? The black community doesn't rock with Tom McDonald like that. Conservatives do, right? Conservatives really do. The black community doesn't, even though he's playing the same character. So while being popular, he's not taken seriously as a rapper because the black community doesn't co-sign him. So while we as a community keep legitimizing people like Lil Pump, keep legitimizing the six nines of the world and keep legitimizing the Island Boys, we'll continue to get things like this. Effin Mecca is what I would call the culmination of everything that we've talked about so far. A virtual AI rapper who was modeled to have colored dreads, face tats, gold grills, and huge chains sound familiar. And while for at least some portion of time, 
the voice behind FN Mecca was black, the executive who headed the project and the creator of the AI were definitely not. And it, of course, didn't help that the executive, Anthony Martini, has had a, should we say, history with the use of the N-word. He was quoted as saying this. Oh wait, no, that, that wasn't him talking about the project. That was him from his song uh, on his band, E-Town Concrete. Like, he's not black. He's not, it's not even, it's not even like, I, I, I don't have any words, I don't know what to say about that one. <laughs> okay, regardless. But about the actual project, he said this. If you're mad about the lyrical content because it was supposedly AI, why not be mad about the lyrical content in general? It's just really a deflection. It's like, well, other rappers say worse things and nobody gets mad at them for that. But when I say it, when I make my, my robot AI say it, it's a problem. And yeah. <laughs> Jarvis Johnson actually made a great video about this rapper that I'll leave in the description where he has this to say. It doesn't matter if uh, there's a black dude rapping the, the words, by the way. It's it's more about the like uh, minstrelsy of kind of having a character that presents as black and kind of takes part in this culture. And then it being like people who are not actually a part of that culture, like sort of posing through the avatar. You know what I mean? Culture vulture AI, exactly. And. That is exactly the point that I'm trying to make. Non-black actors taking aspects of black culture, twisting it, putting it on as a costume and jump Jim crowing themselves into millions of dollars. We've gotten to a point where white label execs have grown tired of dealing with the actual black artists that create the music that they've decided to create their own black bodies to exploit. And speaking of which, the black body has been the commodity of choice for capitalists since this country's inception. As I've spoken to previously, slavery has operated as a primary method of capital accumulation in colonial America. However, even with the Emancipation Proclamation, there has been little done to change this fact. Now we've talked about how non-black actors will commandeer aspects of our culture in order to profit, but when it comes to our bodies themselves, capitalists always find a way. Now the commodification of the black body manifests itself in a multitude of ways. Almost all were derived directly from slavery itself. We see hallmarks of such mirrored in many contemporary institutions, one of which being athletics. Due to the legacy of slavery, among many other systemic factors, the cycle of poverty's hold on our community is ever steady. This is evident in the fact that in 2016 at least, the average black household earned only 10% of what the average white household did. With the rising cost of living, lack of hiring opportunities, and ever-increasing cost of higher education, for many young black boys, the means of which to pull themselves out of this trap was limited to sports. FD Signifier made a great video about how black athletes are exploited and I implore you to watch it. He talks about a lot ranging from childhood and prep sports to professional leagues and it will expand on what I'm talking about here. See, sports hold a very specific and unique position in the black community. Because of the lack of urban development in predominantly black areas, coupled with underfunded after school programs, for many black kids, the only form of peer socialization was relegated to team sports. Now, team sports are a good thing. Young kids getting together and having fun while exercising is positive and should be encouraged. But at a certain point, something switches for these kids. They switch from young kids having fun to talented athletic prospects. He goes by the name Blaze and it's pretty spot on. His dad posts videos of him online that are really blowing up right now. I mean, we really could be seeing a future pro in the making. Welcome back, I'm Blaze, you remember me? I haven't taken any days off. I'm still playing football. Film is everything. On the field, I'm a beast. But combine is different. That's what all the NFL coaches watching. That's why I gotta put on a show. This can be done by coaches, family members, teachers, and even scouts for kids as young as 10 and 12. And when this happens, when kids are no longer treated as kids, but as what they can provide for the future, they become a commodity. And this can be damaging for a young child. Instead of it being a game you're playing with your peers, every action you do or don't take becomes a decision that will impact your future. Education becomes a second priority, and how couldn't it? For many talented student athletes, school becomes the backdrop, the setting, the filler in between practice and games that are the real defining moments for their lives. That idea of going pro, the chance to be the one who makes it and provides a way out for their family to escape their generational curse? For many young black boys, that is their American dream. And like the American dream, it's fickle. As Billy Hawkins wrote in A New Plantation, what is the entire name of this book? The New Plantation, Black Athletes, College Sports, and Predominantly White NCAA Institutions. 
That's a long name. In that book, Billy Hawkins wrote this. Our purpose as black males in this country is largely defined by structural demands and institutional needs, which has mainly required our physicality. Therefore, to a significant degree, our experiences are shaped within the context of these demands and needs. There is a specific emphasis on masculinity and physicality within the black community, especially as it pertains to young black boys. That, in addition to the adultification that we see in all young black children, as well as the inherent aggressive nature of many contact sports, can lead to the reemergence of a particular archetype. These young black boys in the eyes of society are not kids, but are operating in a similar way to the stereotypical buck or brute archetype. And as these kids get older, there's another layer of fetishization and sexualization on top of that. The Buck is a black man whose sole desire is the white woman. As his name suggests, being a reference to the adult male deer, he is large and sometimes menacing. The Brute is an offshoot of the Buck archetype with a specific emphasis on the aggressive nature of the black man. The Brute is a fiend, an animalistic criminal deserving of death who targets helpless victims, specifically white women. Both the Buck and the Brute archetype paint black men as hypersexual and overtly aggressive. It cannot be understated just how damaging this characterization is. But for these institutions, as long as it doesn't affect the bottom line, it doesn't matter. It's all about the capital. Institutions like the NCAA operating at the behest of a predominantly white collegiate industry is no mistake. Its entire business model is predicated on the same practices that chattel slavery perpetuated in order to survive. Billy Hawkins also stated this. As we examine the structure of intercollegiate athletics, a similar conclusion can be drawn where the athlete is not necessarily the property of the institutions but it's the rights to athletes' labor and the profit off of their labor that makes the plantation model appropriate in examining the experiences of black male athletes. Within the current new plantation model of intercollegiate athletics, the NCAA and its member institutions not only profit off of the labor of athletes, in general, and black athletes, specifically, they also profit off of their images. Now the most astute of you may be picking up what I'm putting down. In a way that is identical to what we were talking about with the Mammy and Uncle Tom archetypes, Institutions had no problem slapping their faces on products in order to sell, with no profits ever being reciprocated back to those individuals. The NCAA operated in the exact same way. They are making millions for themselves and these institutions off of the labor provided by black athletes, with those same athletes getting crumbs in return, not even in the form of monetary compensation, but as a scholarship at most. They don't even own their own identities. Like I said, some people ain't been happy with what I've been doing. I'm kind of trying to figure out a way around that. I guess I can't make any videos that make it obvious that I'm a student athlete because that makes it seem like I'm using my likeness in my image to make money and all this, which I'm really not. So I don't know, man. The NCAA has like a 400 page rule book and you know, they probably don't even let you take a shit in certain locations. Who knows? They got that many rules. I have a meeting today with a guy in our compliance office, which basically is a department that makes sure student athletes are following the rules and this and that. Sit down, chop it up with him, see how I can keep doing what I'm doing. My channel depends on the faith of this meet. <laughs> they trying to shut me down, man. Nah, I'm kidding. Uh, everything's gonna go well, you feel me? We're just gonna talk about ways I could keep doing what I'm doing and follow the rules or whatever. 400 page rule book, whatever. I mean, but we about to get this done, man. I'm let y'all know if we good for business or we down for the count. This meeting went well, but it didn't go well at the same time. So basically, I'm not allowed to make any money off my YouTube videos. So I'm working hard, basically like a job, filming, editing, creating ideas, doing things of that sort, and I'm not allowed to make any money. And if I do, then bad things happen. But the NAACP, uh, but the NCAA, it, did I say NAACP? I have to go back and check that. Like the NAACP, NAACP, NAACP is operating. But the NCAA is not the first or biggest institution that will strip you of your identity and use your labor without compensation. <laughs> oh no, that award belongs to one institution and one institution only. One that can legally do slavery as written into the constitution. That's the good old prison system, baby. We love the prison system, don't we? Prison system fans, ain't that right? Ain't that right? Now, of course, exploitation of labor is not something that is exclusive to black people. Worker exploitation is something that happens in all industries, which is why unionization is so important. But it is important to note that not only is slavery allowed to continue due to our great U.S. Constitution, but it is also encouraged by our government and private entities alike. Well, we've known for a very long time that um, the um, structure of racism 
it's such that it invades uh, virtually all of the existing institutions in our society, and especially the penal institutions and law enforcement institutions. One cannot um, study the history of the police without also studying uh, the history of racism. Criminality in this country has always had a distinct tie to the institution of white supremacy. The systems of chattel slavery, debt bondage, and indentured servitude had all required a level of criminality in order to justify its existence. There is an argument to be made that plantations operated as the first prisons in this country, incarcerating an ever-increasing population of African slaves for the crime of merely existing. This parallel runs deeper when we acknowledge that the creation of the modern policing system was derived directly from that of slave patrols. In regard to slave patrols, the NAACP says this, the origins of modern day policing can be traced back to the slave patrol. The earliest formal slave patrol was created in the Carolinas, shout out Carolinas by the way, in the early 1700s with one mission, to establish a system of terror and squash slave uprisings with the capacity to pursue, apprehend, and return one away slave to their owner. Tactics include the use of excessive force to control and produce desired slave behaviors. Now, at a cursory glance, we can definitely draw similarities between slave patrols and our current system of policing. As many of us saw in 2020, the police are not here to protect us. They, as an institution, operate at the behest of capital, valuing that capital over that of human lives. Their motto, protect and serve, only operates as a marketing pitch, only truly protecting capital owners. This is even conjecture. This has been ruled in the court of law. After the Parkland school shooting in 2018, where an armed sheriff deputy heard gunfire inside the school and decided to not engage the gunman, good guy with a gun by the way, the county judge ruled in favor of the cop with the rationale being this, neither the constitution nor state law imposes a general duty among police officers or other government officials to protect individual persons from harm, even when they know the harm will occur said Darrell L. Hutchinson, a professor and associate dean at the University of Florida School of Law. Police can watch somebody attack you, refuse to intervene, and not violate the Constitution. And the craziest part is this is not the only instance of this happening. It isn't even the most recent incidents of this happening. Uvalde is a perfect example of police incompetence and utter ineptitude. Over 350 officers at that school, a single gunman, and it took cops 74 minutes in order to enter. And not only that, but they lied immediately after the shooting. The decision was made that this was a barricaded subject situation. There was time to retrieve the keys and wait for a tactical team with the equipment to, to go ahead and breach the door and take on the subject at that point. How about trying the door and see if it's unlocked? Okay, As, you know, what we used to call a clue. At that point, why not? And, and of course, no one had. But they lack that same sort of hesitation when it comes to dealing with a 12-year-old black boy with a toy gun in the park. These people are not here to protect you. And just as slave patrols have evolved into the current system of corrupt policing we see today, plantations have done the exact same thing. <sighs> in the immediate aftermath of slavery, the Southern states hastened to develop a criminal justice system that could legally restrict the possibilities of freedom for newly freed slaves. Black people became prime targets of the convict leasing system, referred to many as the reincarnation of slavery. Angela Davis, our prison's obsolete. Now, contrary to popular belief, Abraham Lincoln kind of sucked. Not only did he say that he didn't think black people should have equal rights to white people, and the fact that his big emancipation proclamation only freed slaves in the Confederate states, he also gave reparations to former slave owners within Union states in order to keep their support. And following that proclamation and ratification of the 13th Amendment, there was a shortage of labor in the United States. Of course, capital owners could hire the newly freed slaves, giving them adequate compensation for their labor, but of course that didn't happen. Slavery was a capitalist wet dream as it pertained to labor exploitation, so they were going to do anything to capture that same energy. See, the 13th Amendment had a loophole, an oversight if you will, a flaw. Was the flaw planned? Who am I to say? Slavery was indeed outlawed, unless one was convicted of a crime. Now, what did this great country do when they established this flaw? When they, when they, when they noticed that this flaw was occurring, right? They established what is called black codes. Black codes were established laws 
that specifically targeted newly freed slaves covered a large array of actions that would not be criminalized unless the perpetrator was black. These actions included things but were not limited to absence from work, loitering, breaking curfew, insulting gestures or acts, or vagrancy. As you can imagine, newly freed slaves had no job opportunities, no home, a lot of them couldn't even read and write. So you can see how these laws were targeted specifically towards black people. For black people, it became a funnel directly from the plantations into the prison system. And once they were in the system, they were used for labor. Convict leasing was a system that prisons used to lease prisoners to private corporations to be used as a labor force. These prisoners were used to build railways, build mines, and surprise, surprise, to work on plantations. This system operated as a twofold victory for the capital owners. On one hand, they received a workforce that they can treat in any kind of way that they wanted to because the prison population was ever increasing. If a prisoner died, they'd just get a new one. And on the other hand, they can use this source of cheap labor as a way to use certain unionization efforts. Using convicts as scabs was a common tactic used against worker strikes and labor shortages. This in turn led to reduced wages and overall increased turnout for many legitimate employees. This system continued throughout American history as well. In contemporary society, public and private prisons continue to use inmate labor in order to produce goods and services used in society. Whether that be producing commodities, cleaning facilities, serving food, or even working as firefighters, all while making pennies. To put this into perspective, this is a 2018 annual report for the Corrections Enterprise in North Carolina. We can see that inmates produce commodities worth up to $92 million, while the company only paid $3.5 million for offender labor. That's roughly 3.8% of their net profit. And this is only North Carolina. Take into account the entire country and we can see why we have the highest incarceration rate in the world by a wide margin. And while they claim that inmates are receiving real world vocational skills that they can apply when they get out, they don't account for the difficulty these inmates will face when they have a conviction on their record. In North Carolina specifically, only 39% of inmates find a job after a year of being released. And even if you don't know any prisoners, you don't know anybody who's incarcerated or who's been incarcerated, even if you've never been incarcerated yourself and you think that this doesn't affect you. We saw the way convict labor was used against laborers in the reconstruction era, what makes you think the capitalists won't do the exact same thing now? And while this is a labor issue, it is important to note that it has a racial foundation past just its history. According to the Sentencing Project, Black Americans are incarcerated in state prisons at a rate nearly five times that of white Americans. With Black people making up over half of wrongful convictions in 2022 so far, and being sentenced disproportionately for the same crimes, it goes to show that even as time passes, the Black body is still the commodity of choice. TikTok and the way it operates is not unique in the slightest. Before TikTok was around, it was Musical.ly, and before Musical.ly, it was Vine. But what we've seen time and time again is that whatever the newest and hottest social media platform is, there will be those black people. You, you know the ones, you know the ones. Now, TikTok, love it or hate it, is the place that pop culture is bred. Being one of the biggest social media apps garnering 1.2 billion monthly users, TikTok is where the culture is. It is no secret, however, that this app would not be what it is without black culture. Countless sounds, styles, and dances originating from black creators being quietly exported into the wider TikTok atmosphere is the norm. But there are a few who stray the path. Those who decide that instead of embracing our culture and creating content off of that, they take it, twist it, put it on as a costume, and jump Jim Crow themselves into a little bit of clout. They sell their soul, if you will embodying an archetype that we are all familiar with. They become a coon. Now this is what I would call the final form of commodification. It is similar to how a select few free black people during the era of reconstruction decided to engage in minstrelsy. Of course, we can rationalize why they did it, most likely because there was a lack of opportunity for recently freed slaves. The reason isn't particularly important though. What is important is like slavery, like slave patrols and like black-faced minstrelsy, the legacy of this carries on into modern-day society. 
black people adopting characteristics of archetype that have been exaggerated by white people in order to profit is in and of itself commodification of the black identity. Now, where does TikTok fit into all of this? Well, there was an account on TikTok that really sparked the idea behind this entire video around 10, 11 months ago. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, within that time, she got clapped up. She was banned. Thankfully, she's back now and there are some archived posts, but I wanna show you exactly what I'm talking about. Stop being a sussy bug. There's a tiny bit of salt. And just one small bite. right here is gonna put you on your back so obviously there are some undertones and overtones that require addressing this sort of content caters to a specific type of audience and while it might be difficult to tell now that she's banned, she was immensely popular. Garnering over 4.5 million followers before her eventual account termination, we can see that even on her new page a year later, she's still remembered pretty well. But how is this damaging? How does this specifically relate to menstruacy? Well, the answer to that is pretty simple. This character that she is playing is the embodiment of the Piccaninny archetype. To remind you, the Piccaninny was a childlike character, usually with unkempt hair, bulging eyes, red lips, and wide mouths. Piccaninnies have a strong association with watermelon, usually not showing up in a story without one or the other making an appearance. This is where we see a lot of the stereotypes that black people are still associated with today come from. We can clearly see that even if unintentionally, Miss Johnny, Joni? I'm gonna call her Johnny. Miss Johnny is exemplifying these characteristics. I personally believe that this is completely intentional, a calculated move in order to draw in a predominantly white audience and cater to them in their biases. Another great example of this are these TikToks. She said, pass the weed, bitch. I don't like to pass the gas. Blowing bubble, blowing zaza. She got big old titties. I said, goo goo, goo gaga. In a zoo, monkey ass niggas. Ooh, 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 ah, ah. Stop playing with me. When the money talking, I cannot hear what you're saying to me. I'm gonna do a boyfriend haul. So this is the one that I have. I met him in 2014, but he wasn't on the market yet. So in 2016, he was on the market and I decided to see if it was a good investment for me. However, the timing wasn't really right. So it wasn't until the beginning of 2018 that I purchased this one. I don't know the exact month or day, um, that I purchased this one, but it was in the beginning of 2018. One thing that I love about this one is he can literally do anything, fix anything. If he doesn't know how to do something, he will learn that day. Um, <laughs> and I mean, look at him. <laughs> but one bad thing, one con about this model is he's taking a little bit longer than usual <laughs> to upgrade to fiance mode. Uh. So... <laughs> Hopefully soon we'll upgrade to fiance mode, but until- It's just like black people painting their face black with burnt cork, painting their mouths red, and becoming a Jim Crow character during Reconstruction. While they are able to profit off of these stereotypes, the rest of the black community has to deal with the ramification of these types of images being legitimized in wider society. And this isn't just relegated to TikTok either. We've seen it happen with the whole Jordans trend on Vine with King Batch. Hey, how much for them J's? Thousand dollars. So Tell my girl, tell her what, you love her? Tell her stay the hell away from my J's. He mad! No, fuck, I'm not. Be my J's! 
Click your damn J's and repeat after me. There's no place like home. Welcome home, motherfucker! I don't trust you. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, we good, we good, we good. Fake Jordans, get them out of Let's here! Go. Next! 23 on the back. Jordan on the third shoestring. Give me fiber. Good. Next! You gonna work hard! So yes, sir! You gonna be committed! So yes, sir! And then jump down that hole! Captain, I just got these J's. They fresh out the box. Black people consistently putting on a costume of a parodied version of themselves in order to appeal to a non-black audience. It's almost as bad as advocating for policies that work against your own self-interest, like most black conservatives do. Black conservatism is a disease. I hope you get well soon, love. I'd be remiss if I didn't address one of the biggest sects of our community who have sold their soul in an effort to commodify their identity, the black conservatives. Now, I did an in-depth look into Candace Owens and how she completely rewrote her brand in an effort to appeal to the white conservative demographic. So if you're interested in that, you can find that video link in the description below. It's not a great video. It still gets the gist done. The long and short of it is, Candace Owens started her political journey as a liberal. She first won a lawsuit in collaboration with the NAACP for receiving racist voicemails in 2007. She also ran an anti-Republican blog in 2015 where she spoke out about weed and psychedelic legalization, anti-Trump talking points, and even a bit of surplus value theory, weirdly enough. I will totally accept the results of this great and historic presidential election if I win. In this article, she writes, quote, Good news is, they, they referring to Republicans, will eventually die off peacefully in their sleep, we hope. And then we can get right on with the obvious social change that needs to happen immediately. In a separate article titled, Outlawing Psychedelics is Harmful to Humankind, she writes, quote, We need to dial back the stigma surrounding drugs. And this sentiment is further encouraged in the article titled, For Christ's Sake, Let Them Smoke Pot Already, where she writes, This is actually still a debate or topic. Legalize it, tax it, everybody wins and loses. Where she comes on the side of for legalization or at least decriminalization of drug use. But one of the best examples that I believe shows where Candace leans politically is the article titled, Want to Hear Something Gross? Where she writes, Fact, the average CEO takes home 204 times more than his or her employees. I kid you not. You can read more about that here. Now here's my guesstimate. The average employee likely works 204 times harder than that respected CEO. Can we just take a moment and really truly discuss this backwards economic paradigm that exists within most companies? Wow. However, in 2016, when Gamergate hit, if you know how much of a headache that was, she went buck wild. Going off the deep end and completely shedding any semblance of reason to espouse the garbage we see today. She then created the Blexit movement in order to try and persuade black people to move from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. This is particularly insidious because any criticisms of the Democratic Party, for which there are plenty, don't get me wrong, are true twofold, threefold for the evil that exists within the Republican. But I would say one of the worst impacts Candace has had on this planet, besides her birth, has been her connection to Kanye West. Now, Kanye West operates in a unique regard in this conversation. Unlike Johnny Watermelon or Candace Owens, who both had little notoriety before they began appealing to white audiences, Kanye West already had a profoundly successful music career before his descent into conservatism. So while the other two were making clear efforts to commodify the racial aspects of their identity, can we really say that Kanye West is doing the same thing? I would argue yes and no. It's different. Did Kanye West change his messaging and belief system in order to cater to a predominantly white audience in order to profit? I'd argue not necessarily. No, I don't think so. I think Kanye West was duped. I think he was misled and misguided by the company he surrounded himself with. I think it fundamentally is a conversation about impact versus intent. Kanye West and Candace Owens have had similar impacts, not in size, but in what ideological framework they push for. Their words are damaging not only to the black community, but to every marginalized community oppressed under the institution of white supremacy. Globalism is what I, what I don't want. So when you think about whenever we say nationalism, the first thing people think about, in, at least in America, is Hitler. You know, he was a national socialist, but if Hitler just wanted to make Germany great and have things run well, okay, fine. Happy Monday. Hitler was just trying to make Germany great again. Candace Owens is okay with that. I could say anti-Semitic things and Adidas can't drop me. Now what? Now what? They are fundamentally white supremacists. I think they differ not only in size of their impact, but also their intent as well. Candace Owens is a white supremacist because it makes her money. Kanye West is the white supremacist because he was dumb enough to allow Candace Owens and people like her to influence his worldview. He surrounded himself with yes men and pushed out anybody who tried to bring him back from the deep end. Candace Owens is a grifter. 
And it shines through brightest when we saw her trying to get Kanye West to buy her husband company for millions of dollars. A formerly known as Kanye West is grabbing headlines once again today. The world famous rapper is acquiring the social media company Parler, which touts itself as a conservative free speech and uncancelable space. And that is the big difference between them. Now, of course, this isn't to excuse Kanye West's behavior, not in the slightest. He started his descent into darkness years ago at the point in which he endorsed Trump. But then it was different. There he was operating within his class interests. And you know if we're talking about the commodification of the black identity, we have to talk about black capitalists as well. So when I saw 50 Cent endorse Donald Trump on his respective social media channels, was I surprised? Not necessarily. He just flat out said it. He wants the tax breaks. As America continues to vote with just four days till the US election, Donald Trump has gotten another seal of approval from a black male rapper. This time it's Lil Wayne. So there's Lil Wayne at the White House meeting Trump. Unfortunately, I know nobody, nobody ever wants to do it. But we have to, we have to talk about black capitalists. The most insidious lie that capitalism tells is that failure within this system is a personal failing instead of an inherent byproduct of this mode of production. Capitalism can only function if there is a system of winners and losers, haves and have nots. And the ruling class will tell you that the reason you are not a winner, the reason that you are not succeeding within this system is because that you are not working hard enough. Who's, who do you love the most in the world? My family. Good. Who in your family? Pick one. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> You're very politically correct. Cool. Every day, make in the in like literally once a day, genuinely sit there for five minutes and make pretend one of them got shot in the face. The quickest tell that somebody's a loser is complaining. Every kid, every girl, every guy, no matter your situation, the one thing you have is time, and you can work harder. I don't like complaining. If you know you've decided you want to make money and you're gonna do it for seven years, I don't wanna hear you fucking complaining about it every day. Like, shut your fucking mouth, work for seven years, save us money, and go fucking surf for the rest of your life. During that point, what did I do? Is I did what I preached to all of you, which is I put in the work. I gave up all my weekends and holidays in high school because I knew I had to pay that price. I was gonna start with no relationships and in the gutter, and I was gonna have to prove it and I would have to show up and meet everybody like I did in my 30s. But in my teens and 20s, I was gonna have to work. And so what I did was to the extreme of anybody I've met that had options, I punted every leisure activity in my life. Nothing, no weekends, no vacations, zero, nothing, nothing. It is a personal feeling on your part. You aren't putting in the effort. You aren't grinding hard enough. You aren't hustling enough. You must forego the small pleasantries that make life bearable under this system in order to get into the position that they're in. I'm gonna tell you five reasons why you're always gonna be broke coming from a multimillionaire. Number one, you shop at Starbucks. Number two, you do not bring a lunch to work. Number three, you live paycheck to paycheck. Number four, you make your minimum payment on your credit card. Number five, last but not least, you buy liabilities, not assets. Never mind the resources that they were provided. Never mind the generational wealth that many of them have already accumulated even before they were even conceived. And the very, very, very few, very few that do start from humble beginnings and do manage to accumulate a massive amount of wealth have an unfathomable amount of luck that most people can never even dream of. Many black capitalists fall into the second category. Due to systemic and historical factors, the black community has had a precarious relationship with wealth. From the end of slavery into the civil rights era and beyond, the road for my people's growth has been impeded at every turn. So it's understandable that psychologically there'd be this yearning for what one who occupies our position in society. This sort of perspective is what breeds the phenomenon we call hustle culture. While hustle culture exists within other communities because capitalism, it operates to a higher degree within the black community because of other layers of marginalization. We often look towards class liberation as a way to free ourselves from racial oppression due to a degree of powerlessness in changing the systems of white supremacy themselves. To a certain degree, it works. It doesn't remove the systems of oppression, but instead allows an individual the means in which to deal with instances of marginalization when they appear more effectively. A black billionaire won't need to worry about their job application being thrown out because of the way their name sounds because they wouldn't be applying for that job in the first place. A famous black athlete won't need to be as cautious in an interaction with the police because their status, their class position, 
offers them a degree of protection that many of us don't have. This creates an interesting dichotomy between the racial and bourgeois aspects of their identities. And unfortunately, but not necessarily unexpectedly, most often they choose to side with their class interests. So what does this mean? How does this relate to the commodification of the black identity? I think it's best explained if I show you this clip from Jay-Z that went viral on Twitter a couple months ago. Yeah, we're not going to stop. You know, it's the hip hop is young. We still we still growing and we're not falling for that technology, whatever, you know, this public puts out there now that, you know, before was the American dream. Pull yourself out of bootstraps and you can make yourself you can make it in America. All these these lies that America told us our whole life. Um, and then when we start getting it, they try to lock us out of it. They start inventing words like, you know, capitalists and, you know, things like that. I mean. You know, we've been called nigger and monkeys and shit. I don't care. I don't, those words y'all come up with, y'all got to come up with stronger words. When I say y'all, I'm not talking about you. The words they come up with, they got to come up with stronger words. We're not going to stop. We're not going to be tricked out of our position. Y'all locked us out. Y'all created a system that, you know, doesn't include us. We said, fine. We went our alternate route. We created this music. We did our thing. You know, we hustled. We fucking killed ourselves to get to this space. And... You know, now it's like, you know, you know, eat the rich and, the, man, we're not stopping. So that evolution is, you know, from us, you know, we came from selling seven records and selling uh, records out our trunk and, you know, no radio play. And I think reasonable doubt that 36,000 the first week or some, something like that. I may, I may be I may be uh, adding a little to it, you know, so. You know, we come from the, I come from Marcy Projects. In my first house, 615 Lexington Avenue, my mo grandmother's house, seven families live, like, she has seven kids. Uh, my mother and, you know, my parents and siblings lived in that house. My aunt Nisi lived in that house. Hootie lived in that house. Butchie lived in the basement. I mean, this is one house. I went back to that house. Uh, I did an interview with Oprah, and, and, and I couldn't believe how small this house was, that all of us lived in that house. So, again, that evolution that you speak of, it's just real and it's happening in real time. And I'm talking about it. And, um, you know, I'm, we're not going to stop and we're not going to stop talking about it. You're not going to trick us out of and make us feel the shame to be successful in a place that, you know, um, set up a system for us to be dead at 21. Um, I think this perfectly encapsulates the essence of my argument. Here we see Jay-Z using his identity as a black man as a way to deflect criticisms of him as a capital owner. And in the clip, he keeps saying, we did this, we did that. But who is we, really? It's not the black people still living in the hood or the black people still in the projects. It's not the black kids who don't have access to food in the summer. It's not the black mom working three jobs at once to try to feed her family. Or it's not the black communities being over-policed. We never made it. We never will, because that's not how the system is designed, haves and have nots. And white supremacy benefits from this notion. They know that as long as we're hustling and grinding ourselves into the grave, instead of community building, instead of organizing, then we are in no threat to the power structures that they established. The organizing potential of the black community is unmatched. Just look at the civil rights movement. We know that it worked not because the civil rights act was passed, not because we moved past Jim Crow, but they took it upon themselves to kill every one of our leaders who pushed back against the capitalist dogma. A Twitter user by the name of Bella Goss says this, the problem with rich black folks like Jay-Z, Diddy, etc., is that they want to be revolutionary figures like Malcolm X, Fred Hampton, etc., but they still want to have their statuses as actual capitalists. It doesn't work that way. You can't have it both ways. You can't be the black Bill Gates and Malcolm X at the same time. Malcolm X, Fred Hampton were murdered for radicalizing black people, brown people, poor people, etc. They are not costume. They were people who wanted better for all of us. I just want you to be the proud capitalist that you are without trying to intellectualize it. Don't tell me you're a billionaire because it's for the culture. I'm not benefiting from that. You all being billionaires won't improve any of our lives. That's the truth. And yeah, that is the truth. Black capitalism would not liberate the black community. We deserve something better. And yeah, thank you all for, for watching this video. I hope you've learned something about the black identity, commodification, um, prisons, any number of things. And yeah, if you enjoyed it, if you learned something, like, subscribe, share this video with a friend. 
if you're watching this the day this video comes out it should be my birthday as, as long as i didn't screw anything up um but so yeah as a happy birthday to me then share a video with a friend say tell them like hey watch this video and learn something um yeah thank y'all for watching and i hope to see you next time Uh, apartment M on the third floor. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you.